<laughs> and uh, thank you all for coming um, today. Um, I'm going to talk a bit at first around uh, really the biodiversity crisis in the ocean and then how we as taxonomists uh, can actually rise to that, that challenge. Um, just to summarise what uh, Angelica said, I've been around as a marine biologist for uh, over 30 years, I dare say, um, probably before some of you were born. Um, and I've really focused on deep sea ecology, particularly of sea mounts, hydrothermal vents, and cold water coral ecosystems. The interesting footnote to this is I actually started out life as a marine taxonomist, working on nematean worms. But of course, in the UK, as I've moved through my career, uh, it's just not been possible to build a career on nematean taxonomy. So I kind of broadened uh, my areas of work and strangely find myself now, uh, I guess, towards the end of my career, actually refocusing again on nematians and other animals. Um, uh, as Angelica also said, a lot of my work has also strayed into the areas of ocean policy and governance. And all my work has really been feeding data into this ocean management arena and sphere. So as well as uh, gaining expertise on marine ecology, I've also had to learn about ocean law and ocean governance as well. So it just goes to show how really we're becoming a bit more multidisciplinary in terms of what we have to do nowadays uh, for ocean conservation. So I thought I'd just start by reminding us of, of what the ocean actually does for us. And it provides a very wide range of goods and services uh, for humankind. In fact, you could argue very easily uh, that uh, both us and other life on the planet simply wouldn't exist without the contribution of the ocean to the Earth system. Some of these ecosystem services are very, very obvious. So the ocean provides us with fish. So it has a food security aspect. Others are not so obvious, particularly to the general public, such as its role in nutrient cycling, oxygen generation, carbon sequestration, and even cultural and educational aspects as well. There have been figures cast around for the value of ocean services, and you see one here from a WWF report, I think it was 2015, um, uh, where they valued the ocean assets at $24 uh, trillion. And we've seen other figures of $49 million, uh, trillion. But really, the simple fact is that without the ocean, we wouldn't exist and we can't continue uh, to exist. So in fact, human society and all of our economic activities are embedded in the natural ecosystems of Earth, of which the ocean is an important part. And this really was one of the core messages from a UK government, UK Treasury report in 2021 uh, by Das Gupta, which really made this case that without nature, uh, human society simply cannot exist in its current form. Unfortunately, while we've been developing <clears throat> our economies globally, um, the cost of that has been uh, nature and climate change and other impacts. Uh, one measure of this is the Living Planet Index. This is an index which looks at trends of a variety of populations of mammals, birds, uh, amphibians and fish, including uh, marine species. And as you can see here, it's shown a decline of nearly 70% in those monitored populations since 1970. So not only have we been impacting on nature, but much of that impact has been within my lifetime, over the last two to three uh, decades, in fact. 
And the consequences for biodiversity are really significant. Uh, we've lost about half of coral reefs since the 19th century. And now, as a result of climate change, uh, coral reefs are one of the most threatened ecosystems on Earth. And the driver of this is simply warming of the ocean. The ocean has absorbed something like 93% of the excess heat due to the release of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And a result of that is that uh, essentially during heat waves, corals lose their zooxanthellae, the symb symbiotic algae that provide them with nutrition, and corals die as a result. So this is a very, very uh, serious problem. Um, we'll come to the nature of that threat in a moment. But it's not just benthic ecosystems like coral reefs that are under threat. Uh, this is an example of pelagic sharks and rays. There's been a 71% decline in these animals since the 1970s, and now more than three quarters are threatened with extinction. And this is a result of the direct and indirect effects of fishing. So these animals either being targeted by fisheries or caught as bycatch. And as a result, because they have very slow population turnovers, so many of them are long lived, they have low rates of reproduction, it takes them a long time to get to maturity, uh, they are very, very vulnerable to overexploitation. In fact, in many of the same ways that deep sea fish are vulnerable to overexploitation as well. So when we actually come to look at the drivers of extinction threat in marine organisms, we find a variety of, of drivers from really local and regional up to global uh, threats. By far the largest driver is uh, overexploitation. So whether that's as targeted fisheries or as bycatch, what you see here in the orange parts of uh, these pie charts is uh, the level of um, extinction threat from uh, fishing. For reforming corals, you'll see up in the uh, top left-hand corner there, anthozoa, actually it's a much broader range of threats, including an increasing level of threat from uh, climate disruption. So uh, global um, uh, ocean heat waves, um, uh, in particular. And then for some other groups, other uh, drivers are prevalent. So for um, birds, for example, invasive species are a particular threat mainly through predation on nests uh, from things like mice and rats. But of course, these data are really heavily biased. Only a very few marine groups have been assessed. And even for those groups which have been assessed, many of the species within them are classified as data deficient. So there's a real gap here between our need to understand what is happening to biodiversity and what we know about biodiversity, what we know about species, their distribution, and their situation in the environment. And in fact, if you look at overall extinction threat from marine species compared to terrestrial species, the range of extinction threat is actually quite similar. Um, there are some lines of thought that think that marine species are more resistant to extinction than terrestrial species. And indeed, there's some evidence that that is the case. But if certainly going on the evidence from the groups we've looked at so far, the uh, level of extinction threat in terms of proportion of species is similar in the sea as it is on land. This is one of the rarest corals in the world, Cotonella shagui. Uh, this is a photograph we took on an expedition to Chagos, the Chagos Archipelago in the equatorial Indian Ocean in October. And it was one of about 17 colonies that we found. It's distributed only in the Chagos Archipelago 
and a few parts of the territory of Mauritius. And indeed, at the moment, the UK is negotiating with Mauritius over sovereignty uh, of these islands. This year, there is a severe El Nino predicted, which means that we could actually lose this species if a rescue attempt is not mounted to actually go and sample some of these animals live and essentially put them in aquaria. So this is how urgent the whole question around biodiversity loss is becoming. There are new threats appearing in the ocean as well. Uh, you've all probably heard about deep sea mining. This is a reminder that this is not just about the clarion clipperton fracture zone and manganese nodules. There are other mineral resources in the ocean that industry is interested in. These include seabed massive sulfides associated with deep sea hydrothermal vents on ridges and other uh, tectonically active areas, and also cobalt crusts on seamounts and phosphate deposits in areas of the ocean that are associated with very high surface primary production. And in fact, if you look uh, at where these prospective mineral deposits are, you find that they are scattered around the entire globe uh, in parts of uh, the deep sea. And this is actually a map produced by the uh, International Seabed Authority. And you can see these really huge areas of manganese nodules in gray here, but also the seabed massive sulfide deposits, the blue dots, and uh, the areas of cobalt uh, rich ferromanganese crust, mainly located on seamounts. Now, um, Julia here has recently done some work on what the implications of this industry might be for the marine life living around island like habitats like hydrothermal vents in the deep ocean. And this is a great example. It's the scaly foot snail, an animal which I had the pleasure of meeting out in the ocean about 10 years ago. Uh, actually, probably longer than that now. Um, it occurs at, uh, between 2,000 and 3,000 metres depth, but it's been found only at three sites around hydrothermal vents with a total area of about 2.0 two square kilometers. So the fact that two of these sites are already under exploration licenses, and we tried to get to one of those sites back in 2016, uh, and couldn't, unfortunately, because of the weather and because non-cooperation of the uh, country that had the, uh, the licenses, um, uh, we don't actually know what these exploration activities have already done to some of these sites in terms of whatever activities they're doing for mineral uh, research. But the simple fact of the matter is that if mining starts on hydrothermal vent sites for these seabed massive sulfides, species like this are under a high risk of uh, extinction. So, what do we know about ocean biodiversity? Well, we know that at higher taxonomic levels, higher phyletic uh, levels, the ocean is much more diverse than land. Something like 33 uh, phyla, according to WORMS, uh, World, um, uh, World Register of Marine Species. Um, 32 of those are found in the ocean, so only one not found in the ocean whilst only 17 on land and in fresh water. Species diversity, uh, we know or think, is much higher on land, basically because of insect diversity. And at the moment, there's about 242,000 uh, marine species described um, uh, on the worms database. We recently sort of summarised um, ocean biodiversity information in the paper in advances in marine um, uh, biology. And the story that came out there is probably a familiar one to most of you of uh, high species diversity in equatorial regions of the world, particularly 
the Indo-Pacific uh, Coral Triangle. However, there is evidence that uh, traditional views of where the biodiversity hotspots in the world are may not be uh, the case. Generally, as I said, the Indo-Pacific Coral Triangle is considered as the most diverse spot in the oceans, followed by the Caribbean. But in fact, there's growing evidence that the northern Mozambique Channel may in fact be in the number two spot. Um, the area is not that well researched, but evidence is suggesting that it has high levels of connectivity with the Indo-Pacific Coral Triangle, for example. Historically, or over geological times, it seems to have accumulated uh, species and it includes elements of the relict uh, Tethian uh, fauna. So we really need to understand more about this region and indeed many other parts of the global ocean before we can really be confident about even regional and global patterns of biodiversity. If you look at latitudinal patterns of diversity, then you find they actually change with the depth uh, of the biota that you're looking at. And this has only really been looked at in detail for brittle stars off the Uroids to date. But you can see here that the centre of biodiversity for uh, brittle stars in shallow water is around uh, equatorial latitudes or either side of equatorial latitudes. As you get deeper, that centre goes into mid-latitudes. And this is connected with food supply uh, to the deep sea. So it's mid-latitudes where you're getting the greatest input of organic material into the deep ocean. Even how many species there are in the ocean is open to a lot of speculation at the moment. Um, if you look at the predicted number of species based on experts, uh, number of experts, um, number of ta taxonomic experts globally, and uh, the level of um, species description that each taxonomist um, uh, undertakes, then you come up with estimates somewhere between um, uh, 0.7 to 1 million species in the ocean. There's a paper by Appleton's et al. in 2012 which did this. In the same year, there was another paper that suggested that diversity could be as low as 0.3 million. Given we're already at 242,000 species and the rate of species discovery, as you'll see in a minute, shows no sign of slowing down, I think that lower number is probably unrealistic. Expert opinion. Um, expert opinion has also been uh, used to try and estimate um, species biodiversity. Um, this is an example from coral reefs. Uh, Fisher et al. 2015, where they came up with an estimate of the species associated with coral reefs at somewhere between half a million and 1.3 uh, million species. That is just for shallow water coral reef environments. But actually, coral reefs extend into much deeper water than we previously really realised. And in fact, what are called mesophotic reefs the parts of reefs that are distributed between 40 metres down to about 150 metres, the deepest depth at which you get zooxanthellate coral is about 170 metres, then uh, you realise there's a whole area of reefs that's barely explored. The linear extent of these mesophotic coral ecosystems is probably at least as large as shallow water coral ecosystems. But, um, and it's only now, as we've acquired new technologies, such as mixed gas rebreathing and the use of light submersibles, that we're starting to really explore these ecosystems. But the story doesn't end there. This is actually us uh, enjoying a submersible dive on a seamount 
um, just off of Bermuda. This comes up to a summit depth of about 70 metres, and you can see that the Seamount Summit is completely covered with this forest of marine algae. This is uh, from the genus Spirotnus. You can see the submarines getting blown around there because, of course, with this huge lump of seamount in the way, the current has to accelerate to flow over and around uh, this seamount. Now, we thought Bermuda would be a well-explored environment, given the presence of the uh, uh, BIOS lab there, and it's been there now for the good part of a century. But when we started to look at these mesophotic ecosystems, using submersibles and uh, divers deploying this technical diving equipment, we found a lot of new species. In particular, new species of red algae. Some of these, the closest relatives, were found in Australia. And what that says to you is not that they've got some bizarre biogeographic pattern, it's simply that uh, the taxonomy of these groups of organisms has been very, very poorly studied at mesophotic depths. Not only is there now a mesophotic zone, but also what we're calling the rarephotic zone, the zone between 150 and 300 metres depth. And we were quite surprised in Bermuda to see what we all think of as shallow water uh, fish species basically foraging around at 300 metres depth. This is obviously uh, a moray eel. And if you actually look at the distribution of different uh, fish species, um, you can see quite clearly their shallow water communities in what we call the altiphotic zone, so 15 to 30 metres, a distinct upper and lower mesophotic set of communities, and then this other community in the rarephotic zone from 150 to 300 metres, which is characterised by shallow water fish families, but living right on the edge of the bathyal zone. So these communities, both mesophotic and rarephotic, are barely explored in tropical oceans. So, my final sort of example of this to bring home the message is of hydrothermal vents. And this is some apologies for the jerkiness of this film, but my computer is a bit steam powered. Um, these are hydrothermal vents that we actually found in the Southern Ocean in the uh, uh, early 210s, I think it was. Um, and the reason we wanted to go to uh, the Southern Ocean was that Scientists has, had explored hydrothermal vents in the three major oceans in the world, the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans. And we knew that the biota of the Atlantic hydrothermal vents was quite different to that in the Pacific, really dominated by uh, shrimps, um, uh, like this Rimicaris exoculator, mussels, and other organisms. Then the uh, vents in the East Pacific, very much dominated visually by these giant tube worms and other species of Sibboglinid and polychaete uh, worms. And then the Western Pacific vents, again, had a different type of fauna. The Indian Ocean seemed to have a kind of mixture of the two. So some organisms which had an obvious affinity with the Pacific vents and others an obvious Atlantic affinity with some local flavour in terms of our friend the scaly foot uh, snail again. So um, we really wanted to get down to the Southern Ocean to look at whether it was actually acting as a transoceanic highway over geological timescales for the dispersal of these animals from uh, these different large oceans. And we were told that you just couldn't operate uh, deep submergence equipment in the Southern Ocean because the weather was too bad. And indeed, this is one of the storms that we had during the two expeditions that I was on. Uh, the first one to locate these vents 
in a second to actually explore them. The wave height during this photograph, by the way, was about 15 metres. So it can be quite a hairy place to, uh, to go and work as Angelica probably well knows. But um, the long and short of this was that we did indeed find these hydrothermal vents uh, along a ridge, the East Scotia Ridge, indicated there by ESR. And the vents occurred in places where uh, the ridge was essentially swollen because uh, there was a magma chamber sitting under the ridge. And that, of course, was supplying the energy for these uh, hydrothermal vents. And we had a big surprise when we actually found them. Uh, this is video footage from the cruise that I led. Um, and rather than finding a mixture of species from uh, the Pacific or Atlantic, uh, we actually found a completely different biological community living around these hydrothermal vents. This is at a depth of about 2,400 meters, I think. Um, uh, these vents um, have a maximum temperature of up to about 386 degrees C. Um, these animals are living around the diffuse flow areas. So a maximum temperature here of about um, uh, 20 degrees C or so. And as you'll see as we zoom in here, they, these um, uh, what are called Yeti crabs spend a lot of time essentially clubbing each other to get the best position around this fluid flow. Um, these are called Yeti crabs because they're hairy. The first species to be found had hairy arms uh, or hairy keely. Um, and new species had a hairy chest. And hence it became nicknamed the Hoff crab after David Hasselhoff, who some of you are probably too young in the audience to know who he was, but he was a very hairy chested American actor uh, who starred in Baywatch, I think it was. Um, the scientific name, Kiwa Tyleri, was actually named after the chief scientist of this whole uh, hydrothermal vent program. And um, you actually have both the holotype and parotypes of this animal here in the Senckenberg Museum. And this is one. Um, you'll probably be quite thankful this is in a jar of ethanol because I can tell you these animals are really smelly when you get them up from, uh, uh, from the hydrothermal vents. And in fact, some of the big male crabs you find on the chimneys are actually completely matted in uh, sulfur bacteria and are blackened with sulfur. So that was a new species of Yeti crab. Uh, you'll see these uh, quite large snails here. They're, they're kind of bigger than what we would call a garden snail in the UK. This was a new species and genus, Gigantopelter. On the uh, animals, you can see these little green dots everywhere. That was a new species of hydrothermal vent limpet. And indeed, these barnacles were a new species of volcano lepus, um, uh, which is a stork barnacle uh, group that are endemic to hydrothermal vents as well. What was really odd about this community was it was missing all of the things we were really expecting to see. There were no vent shrimp, which occur in the Atlantic and Indian Ocean, no mussels, no vent crabs, no sibok linids, no scale worms, um, and no alvinellids. So this was a complete surprise. And in fact, every megafaunal species we found on these vents was new to science. And indeed, this single cruise effectively changed the picture of the biogeography of hydrothermal vents globally. So after this cruise, um, we actually did an analysis which suggested that there are 11 distinct types of community which occur on hydrothermal vents globally. And I think it's remarkable that we are still in a situation where a single four or five week expedition can change our idea about the biodiversity and distribution of life in the ocean. So 
how are we actually doing in terms of describing the ocean's biodiversity? Well, this is a graph which I drew up just a few weeks ago from um, uh, the WORMS database. And the remarkable thing here is that since about the mid 19th century, we haven't actually sped up a lot in terms of our rate of description of marine species. At the moment, we're describing somewhere between 2,000 to 2,500 species a year. And in fact, on average, it takes about 13 and a half years to describe a species from when it's collected. Now, that, of course, can be as little as less than a year if you taxonomists really get a shuffle on and go for it after a cruise to describe something special that, that you found. But it can be as long as 25 years on average for some groups like marine sponges. This is not going to help us solve the biodiversity crisis in the ocean. It is simply too slow a process. So why is this going on? Well, I think some of it is because taxonomy has almost diverged in a way to a study of evolutionary biology because, of course, we're all graded on high-impact papers, so taxonomists have tended to push in that direction in terms of their work and maybe focus less on the species description part of the job. So we have this kind of dichotomy almost between evolutionary taxonomy, which really needs lots of informative characters um, to test evolutionary or taxonomic hypotheses, a maximum number of morphological traits, um, maximum number of uh, DNA sequence data, and so on. Whereas for the ecological side of our studies, we really need the minimum number of characters we can get away with to describe a species. Um, we want to just skim that genomic data to get the taxonomically relevant information out. And we're really starting to focus on eDNA barcoding, metabarcoding, and so on. So this is a very interesting time. Somehow we've got to kind of you know, bring these two areas together. So this is all the background to the new Ocean Census Programme. So it was conceived by the Nippon Foundation. Uh, they asked for a feasibility study to be done by the Necton Foundation. Um, and that happened to fall really within the period of COVID. So people like me who spend a lot of time out at sea were sitting on our backsides at home, basically locked up um, and uh, so in some ways, the timing uh, was quite fortunate. Um, we uh, essentially brought together working groups from around the world. These were quite equitable in terms of trying to represent both uh, high income, middle income and low income uh, nations, but also both young and more senior scientists and so on uh, to really look at this problem. And the Nippon Foundation's challenge was simply to accelerate the discovery of species in the ocean. And this is kind of the crux of what we came up with. Essentially a program which developed new expeditions to go out and collect more organisms, but also obviously to try and deal with our long backlog of specimens which are lying in various places around the world. Uh, to develop a network of biodiversity centres, all working towards this same goal, um, to harness new technologies and develop new capacity and new ways of working to accelerate that whole taxonomic process. The number of species we can describe is simply partly a function of the number of people we've got working on the problem. And then a whole in a more rigorous approach to digitization of data to enable things like cyber taxonomy and the use of eDNA for biodiversity monitoring. And this would be all handled by not a new database, 
but a really new interface to existing databases, which we're calling the Cyber Biodiversity System. Kind of core to this digitization concept, uh, digitization concept is what we're calling digital life form. This has also been referred to recently in the literature by Hardisti et al, who uh, published a paper last year as the digital extended specimen concept. Now you notice the use of digital life form as a term here has not got the word taxonomy anywhere in it. And that was to avoid any confusion that this is uh, a species description. That comes later. The aim here is to really create a virtual taxon uh, which remains in perpetuity. So as we're collecting the organism, we're collecting all the data around it, it's being digitized, and then the species description part comes later. So here's a this kind of expressed diagrammatically. Uh, we're out on our expedition. We designate the specimen with a, a unique identifier. It's identified as far as we can go using open nomenclature. All the environmental data collected with that specimen is digitized. This goes down to even filming the collection process for the specimen, if, if you have that capability. Um, all of that is done to a standard, standardized protocol. And then the cyber biodiversity system ingests that information and feeds out the relevant data to the relevant global databases. So obviously OBIS, the o Ocean Biodiversity Information System for species records, INSDC for genetics data and so on. Not all types of data have global databases. So things like video data and stills pictures, for example, there is no globally accepted database for those forms of data. So the idea is to basically develop data incubators for those types of data, which we hope eventually will become global databases. And then to also interface this tool with tools for specific users, such as industry, government, the public, and so on. This is also about developing new technologies to actually sample and capture organizer, uh, organisms, not organizations. Um, uh, so some organisms are just extremely delicate or they live in habitats which are just really difficult to sample. Um, pelagic organisms are the classic examples. So gelatinous deep water organisms are notoriously delicate and fragile. Even if you're able to collect those organisms intact, they often disintegrate when you put them in preservative. Um, so there's been some nice work done in the States about how you can actually collect these animals intact from ROVs or submersibles using things like this rotary actu actuated dodecahedron sampler, which is a really nice device that almost encapsulates an organism in a pocket of water, which you can then bring up to the surface and study that animal whole. Um, this is another example, uh, which we developed in Rev Ocean, uh, which has acquired the name of Alex's angry Cora, and you can see why it's quite a ferocious looking instrument. But this is specifically designed to core unconsolidated sediments. So things like carbonate gravels around cold water coral reefs, which you haven't got a hope of sampling using a conventional uh, coring system. Imaging is really advancing quickly in the digital age. And we believe that high resolution 2D and 3D imaging such as micro CT are really going to help us speed up some of the processes, not only around actually recording taxonomic characters, but then in terms of cyber taxonomy, making that information digitally available to taxonomists around the world. Um, this really, you know, is key in removing that 
necessity for flying specimens around the world or shipping them uh, so that taxonomists can examine them or indeed for taxonomists to undergo expensive travel to institutions to examine uh, collections. So this could actually really in itself help to speed up the taxonomic process uh, in, in a, a really nice way. New sequencing technologies are becoming available, which will enable us to undertake things like genome skimming actually out on expeditions. This is not just important in and of itself. It can be particularly important if you're operating in a low or middle income country, which has very, very limited infrastructure for genetics work and can enable you to train and help people within these countries to actually you know, learn how to do DNA sequencing and analyze their own DNA data on site during expeditions. And I don't know whether any of you, well, I'm sure some of you have used this Oxford nanopore technology, but that sequencing chip in that photograph is about this big. So they're quite easy to transport out even to quite primitive field conditions and certainly on ships uh, to be able to use for genome skimming, barcoding, or whatever you want. Artificial intelligence is very much uh, in the news at the moment, and we believe it also has a strong contribution to make to helping us with this problem of describing the ocean's biodiversity. You're all probably familiar with the use of uh, machine learning for identification of images of organisms, but AI is also applicable to a whole range of other types of data that you can use to understand the biodiversity of a particular area that you're working on. So it can be used on um, uh, acoustic data, that's both passive acoustic and active acoustic data to discern uh, species or levels of biodiversity in an area or indeed to monitor ecosystem health. It will also enable us to really look at the quality of data coming into the cyber biodiversity system. So it should help us to actually help taxonomists to make sure that they're not making mistakes when entering data into this digital uh, system. The expeditions that we'll be undertaking in ocean sensors are not just deep sea expeditions. Ocean sensors works from the seashore right down to hadal depths. So we're looking at a range of expeditions from scuba diving expeditions to technical diving using mixed gas rebreathers light submersible, small ROVs, down to the heavy deep submergence equipment that many of you will be familiar from uh, in terms of use on large research vessels. As I said, increasing number of people doing taxonomy is a really important aspect of uh, what we're doing. Um, this is normally termed uh, capacity development and has almost in some ways become, well, we must include people from X, Y, and Z country. But the critical reason for doing this in the terms of ocean census is that we really need more hands on deck in terms of tackling uh, this species description problem. And indeed, many uh, low and middle income countries are located near to the highest biodiversity areas of the ocean. It is also becoming more and more difficult to export material from these countries uh, to work on in institutions essentially in the West. So why not train people to actually work on them actually in the same region or same country where, uh, um, where uh, these organisms live? Co-production of science is going to be a major key in the ocean census. 
Um, and this is not just co-production in terms of bringing people from a country onto an expedition and that being it. This is right from the planning stage of expeditions, the execution of field work, data analysis and writing of papers and writing of reports for people like policy makers and so on. And it's really important that this whole process of expedition development involves the government and the academics of the coastal state in which you're operating so that the science is really directed for the greatest benefit of the country. So our expeditions normally involve a year or several years of visits and talking to people and understanding what the country really needs in terms of work, but also in terms of capacity development. And indeed, Ocean Census is being conceived as an open network programme. So we intend to develop a network of biodiversity centres around the world, and those will range from very sophisticated centres like the Senckenberg, which is well equipped with large collections, down to new institutions in low and middle income countries which develop their own capacity to really take on this problem of describing and monitoring ocean biodiversity. We've also conceived of the development of virtual taxonomic networks for individual groups, so one for a certain group of crustaceans, one for a certain group of mollusks and so on, where experts from around the world can get together and decide on standards and approaches to work and so on. The whole Ocean Census programme will be coordinated by the Necton Foundation, which is a, a not-for-profit or actually a charity operating in the UK. Um, the other aspect of uh, Necton is it has a very good record in terms of public communication and public outreach. So, as I said, this network is there in terms of academics and so on, but also to bring in uh, government agencies and government fleets, expedition operators, philanthropists, media organisations, and so on. And public engagement is really an important activity for Ocean Census. And it's not just focusing in on, you know, 30 new species from here and a dozen from here. It's actually all about people and understanding people's connection with the ocean, understanding how change in the ocean is affecting them, and really getting them to talk about that um, themselves. And these are just some examples of some of the Necton output from the Maldives expedition that really captured a lot of public uh, attention. So, what we hope will be the impact of ocean census is to accelerate species discovery in the ocean. We've got the figure here of tenfold. We'll see whether we achieve that in 10 years. Uh, to enable cyber taxonomy and the digital taxonomic entity concept, to develop a long-lasting and equitable network of centres and taxonomists working on this problem. Uh, to educate and enthuse the public about the importance of ocean life, to secure long-lasting stewardship of biological material and genetic data, try to understand the distribution of life in the ocean, or better understand it, um, to enable biodiversity monitoring tools, and to really foster improved and adaptable management of the ocean, and really to generate a permanent transformation in the way that we do things. So, as I said at the beginning, the founding organisation of Ocean Census is the Nippon Foundation. They provided initial funding for three years because of the nature of the way uh, they donate. Um, uh, that's the way they're doing it. Um, uh, but it's hoped that this will be a 10-year programme. Um, there is further funding coming online with a new programme called Ocean Shot, which was announced, I believe, last week. 
and Ocean Shop is there specifically to fund expeditions and to fund technology development for things like taxonomy. Um, the implementing organisation is Necton, um, and we're in the process at the moment of gathering partners from all around the world. Those were academic partners, philanthropic, industry, and so on. So I thought I'd just stop with a little piece of video here that we took out in Chagos. You can see what appears to be a sea anemone on the uh, sea floor here. But this is a sea anemone which kind of self ejects from the uh, sea floor. And we actually managed to catch this animal using the manipulator of the submersible. And it has a very strange structure at the base, not like a normal sea anemone uh, at all. So, although we're pretty certain this is a cnidarian, um, we're not quite sure what group it falls into. And for those in the know, there has been a completely new um, group of these organisms found uh, recently. So I'll leave uh, Leighton, the uh, submersible engineer there, um, uh, who is the one who is expressing so much surprise at finding this animal. Um, so just to summarise, the ocean is a critical component of the Earth system for all of us. Uh, much of it remains to be explored. We really need to understand the distribution of life to manage human activities in the ocean. You're all part of that. Um, and Ocean Census really aims to form a permanent transformation to the speed of discovery of life in the ocean and the engagement of the public to really promote sustainable stewardship of the uh, ocean. And that's it. Thank <laughs> you.